So this is uh, our presentation, the ASC's presentation on uh, our experiences, lessons learned, and, and how we decided to uh, sponsor refugee and form the committee, et cetera. Um, so to start it off, I'm going to actually hand it off to Jenna Lee, who is the president of the Atheist Society of Calgary. Thanks, Brent, and thanks everyone for coming this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, so the Atheist Calgary of, or the Atheist Society of Calgary uh, started in sort of late 2017, 2018, and we formed this group uh, because we recognized a need to have sort of a local, a really local community formed. Um, and we are a registered society under the Alberta Society Societies Act. And our mission statement is, um, as on the screen, the mission of the Atheist Society of Calgary is to be a safe and supportive secular community dedicated to serving society, to support those who have been marginalized or traumatized as a result of faith-based beliefs, and to provide and promote evidence-based learning opportunities. Thanks, Brent. So we really wanted to build a community, but we wanted to be more than just a social club. So when we, um, in the before times, uh, when COVID was not an issue, we were typically hosting um, around 10 events every month. Uh, and those were a variety of things like a pub night. Uh, we have a book club that meets monthly. We do a monthly movie night. Uh, we do coffee meetings. Um, we meet on the weekends for, for walks often. And then we do um, a regular, sorry, regular um, educational events uh, like seminars and, and webinars that we hold approximately monthly. Um, we have hosted a skeptic camp and um, we hope at some point to host a conference which was planned uh, and then was canceled because of COVID. So hopefully that's gonna happen. But more importantly, the, the um, the reason that I wanted to be part of this organization was for the community service aspect. So we run a monthly Life Without Religion, or actually it's twice a month now, uh, support group for people who have been traumatized by religion and by leaving religion. Um, and then we do um, regular community service works, like uh, we have adopted a highway, we participate in the city of Calgary's river cleanup every year, and we do regular blood drives. And under that kind of umbrella um, also is included our, um, our refugee sponsorship committee. So go ahead, Brent. Thank you. So we, um, we regularly get requests through our website and through our email for uh, people looking for help, people who are in, um, have had to flee or are uh, worried about being outed as atheists around the world and are really looking for support and help to, uh, to come to Canada. Um, we get uh, probably every week, we, we get a, a new request from someone um, and so we were trying to figure out what, what we could do, what was possible. And so um, we just put a call out on our meetup page to say, you know, is anybody interested uh, in coming together and, and seeing if we can sponsor a refugee? And we did that and um, we ended up with, uh, in, this was in June, 2019. And we ended up with several people who were very interested and committed uh, to helping us form this committee um, and, and uh, try to sponsor a refugee. And Brent was one of those people. And thank goodness, because my strengths are in bringing people together, but not in all of the details that had to happen to make this, uh, make this application uh, complete. So I'm gonna hand it over to Brent to uh, tell you how we did it. Thanks, Jen Ali. So uh, we basically started off with a simple goal, but little knowledge, um, as Jen Ali just mentioned, uh, ASC was receiving several requests each month from pe people seeking help, uh, particularly people in, in dire straits and um, in danger in their life for their lives. Um, so some of the ASC members had attended the refugee sponsorship training program uh, workshop that uh, we'll see a 
some of that today uh, after our, our presentation. Uh, and we then started reaching out uh, to contacts, um, for example, the Atheist Alliance International Secular Rescue uh, Group of CFI. Now I noticed uh, Matthew Cravada was uh, listed as being uh, interested in this meeting. I don't know if he's actually attending, but uh, um, Matthew was our contact at the Secular Rescue uh, Group out of the CFI US. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, we started conducting our research into how as private citizens, we could sponsor uh, refugee, um, one of them being the group of five private, private sponsorship. There was also a blended visa office referral program, uh, abbreviated BOVAR. Um, it was actually uh, appealing initially because it was a combination of private sponsorship, but there is also some federal support involved. Um, however, as an atheist uh, society, we weren't able to determine if we could find someone who was a fellow atheist in a refugee scenario. So um, we um, didn't pursue the BOVAR program, which uh, apparently is, is actually on temporary hold at this point, I, I understand. Um, RSTP people can address that later, um, but um, we then decided we work on, on the group of five uh, private sponsorship um, and we actually um, got a reference to Omer, who um, most, a lot of people on this call are probably familiar with. Uh, CFIC is helping support Omer on an ongoing basis. And our group um, selected him to, uh, to be part of our, uh, our application for sponsorship. And we got that reference through the CFI uh, US Secular Rescue uh, contact. Matthew Cravada. So a uh, special shout out, shout out to uh, Matthew for that uh, reference. So uh, briefly, some, some of the challenges we have faced uh, in this whole process, uh, documentation, funding, processing delays, and specifically and unfortunately how they have been affecting Omer. First uh, item that um, we found a challenge was the all the documentation requirements. Initially, it was pretty confusing and difficult to manage. So the committee decided it'd be best to designate one of the committee members uh, to manage and, and collate the documents. And that person was myself, actually. So um, the requirement being that it had to uh, the documentation had to be meticulous and well organized uh, because we were. Um, it was emphasized by the RSTP that um, if it's not well organized uh, on the original application, it can get rejected, um, and then you have to resubmit again. So it, it really is a complicated process if you don't do it right the first time. So what I found was helpful was to actually create a, an Excel spreadsheet. I won't go into too much detail uh, on that spreadsheet, but I thought it would be uh, worth itemizing it or illustrating it in case anybody else is interested in um, sponsoring, uh, they're welcome to get a copy of this template. So basically, very briefly, just uh, highlighting the columns, um, the documents that were required, then uh, if there was a link to where those documents uh, are brief, uh, summary of the requirements and then the next few columns to do with the refugee themselves and also the sponsors their requirements of each document so um, as time as as I got received the documents I would um, um, note that in this template so as I say I'm not going to emphasize or give much more detail um, fair amount of documents as you can see from the list here but um, that was the documentation requirements. Another item uh, was raising funds. As we were um, looking at just one person, Omer, um, 
a single refugee uh, fund requirement um, at the time was 16,500. And I believe that hasn't changed. Um, RSTP later on can give that uh, clarification. Uh, basically the funds were required to provide 12 months of income support and startup costs for this person once they came into Canada. Three options uh, to demonstrate that we had the funds. The first one being that the funds were pre-allocated and in a trust fund at a financial institution. Though actually the fund doesn't have to be an actual trust fund, it just needed to be in a financial institution with two co-signers that were, part, that were uh, one of the sponsors. There's also the uh, possibility that um, some of the group members, or the sponsors rather, um, would make a financial commitment um, for this ongoing uh, support. Or uh, third option being actually a, um, a combination of, of the two. There are other um, financial requirements and conditions, but the RSTP will probably go cover that in later. So good news for us is uh, our committee was able actually to raise sufficient funds from generous donations by Atheist Alliance International, CFI out of the States and individuals. And once again, a shout out to CFIC who's actually also supporting Omar on an ongoing basis on a day-to-day -day requirements. So our committee was able to um, was was not required to have any further ongoing financial commitment from anyone on the, on the, the committee, which was a nice that's a nice feeling once you had that all in place. And this is it. Uh, speaking of what's what's in place, um, we have a total now of just over seventeen thousand in this in this fund pre allocated, so uh, no further other commitments. And a big shout out to uh, the CFI US who contributed the lion's share of the funds, uh, approximately almost $8,800 Canadian. And also the Atheist Alliance International um, gave a nice donation of, of 3,000. And also here's a special note of appreciation uh, to a French citizen uh, who, was, who found out about Omar's plight while in Nepal studying French, uh, sorry, teaching French. And she generously donated a sizable amount of her own money to the trust fund. And the other item that a uh, noteworthy item was um, the ongoing processing delays. So, you know, we're really fortunate to live in Canada. We um, take it for granted, but Canada is consistently ranked as one of the best countries in the world. So there's a lot of interest in immigrating into Canada and that puts a lot, a huge strain on the general uh, immigration process. We also feel that the Group of Five Refugee Sponsorship um, Program, because it typically involves just a single person, maybe a couple, sometimes a, a small family, it does seem to have a lower priority uh, to other programs. Also our claim, has been complicated by Omar being in Nepal. Uh, there is no Canadian government um, presence in Nepal for private sponsorship. So our file ha has been sent to uh, New Delhi, India office. We, we felt that the life-threatening persecution because of non-belief, um, specifically, for example, Omar, which a lot of people are familiar with his plight, um, we, we've learned that it was not, his scenario was not considered unique. We um, attempted to expedite his, the application for Omar, um, initially through the original application where we put in a special request at the time. And then we did a, um, a further inquiry um, a while after that. We also had some group members doing some other investigations. One of our members contacted her local MP, uh, MP's office and um, had them investigate. Um, and unfortunately we found that he, uh, Omar's situation was not considered unique. 
this point, a special uh, shout out to CFIC and other secular groups in Canada, um, including ASC, that, uh, uh, for attempting to level the playing field for non-belief, uh, sorry, non-believers through a petition to the federal government and among other things. And uh, of course, processing delays, last but not least, of course, is COVID and the, imp or the impact of COVID can be found in the, the next bullet point here where as of October 31st, uh, Canada had, had accepted approximately 4,500 privately sponsored refugees where the target for 2021 was 22,500. COVID also has been affecting other uh, government processes. Um, after about 20 months of, uh, from our application, um, we wanted to get some status update on the, on the file. So we put in a uh, request for access to inform information requests in, into the government to uh, get notes on the file to see if there's any activity and where it stood because we had no other feedback for that whole uh, 22 months or 20 months or so. Unfortunately, the access to information and privacy has also been delayed. So we haven't got a response after two months from that as well. So anyone receiving uh, CFI's monthly newsletter is aware of the challenges that Omer is, is going through. So this is, the point of this workshop is to basically highlight that personal element. And it's, this delay has been very negatively affecting Omer um, with this continued isolation in a foreign country with financial and emotional stress, um, had some stress induced health issues some challenges and delays in getting support because of his locations. So uh, our frustration in the delays is nothing compared to what Omar is going through, unfortunately. So lessons learned. We uh, would recommend anybody looking at um, privately sponsoring a refugee, uh, reach out to some organizations you may have contacts with who have some knowledge and experience uh, and funding for sponsoring refugees. So ASC, uh, we've sort of learned the ropes and we have some uh, knowledge and experience so we can provide some feedback. Um, and if you need more info, um, you can contact us through the ASC website. We're not uh, experts in any measure, but we do have some experience, so we possibly could give you some feedback. Our lesson learned uh, for sure is uh, the process may be uh, very long and depending on location of the refugee, where they are, and also other events <laughs> out of our control, uh, for example, COVID. And sadly, because uh, there are so many valid refugee claims from people fleeing from danger. It's very hard to get a uh, refugee application expedited. Even though uh, Omar was in hiding uh, in fear of his life because of the threats he had, on, ongoing threats he had. And we, we attempted to expedite uh, the application. Uh, we learned that his situation wasn't considered unique, which is, a sad state of affairs, unfortunately. And we don't actually feel that non-belief is treated the same way as religious persecution. A recommendation we'd have is even though the minimum uh, requirement is for five private citizens to be part of this group of five sponsors um, application, uh, consider getting another one, maybe uh, up to six. Um, if, if you do anticipate a long process, um, it, you can, it, this would allow you to accommodate potential changes uh, if one of the sponsor's status or availability changes. Though you could in follow up um, at another sponsor at some point, it's a little more complex if you don't have them already up front. And in retrospect, pretty obvious um, 
recommendation is you create a, a committee and also include those who uh, aren't able to be sponsors, but want to help in other ways. And for example, our group had nine, nine members in total. Some of them have signed up. I'm not sure if they're all online, but a special shout out to um, the people who uh, were part of the committee and, and um, helped uh, helped with the, the load um, and their specific expertise um, made it a lot easier. And what, as committees tend to do, you uh, should assign some roles to uh, certain fundraising and other kinds of activities. Uh, a note that if you do commit to being a sponsor, you are committed for the long haul for that uh, application, which includes right to the point of the one year period when the, this person would come to Canada. Um, so if you do commit to one uh, sponsorship, uh, you cannot sign up for another one. We also recommend that one of the sponsors, specifically a sponsor, um, be as designated as the application submitter. The application can be submitted online, uh, sorry, by email, pardon me, uh, but it needs to meet certain criteria and all the documentation has to be well organized. For example, uh, in the case of the application for Omar, uh, five emails were required with a total of 32 attachments because of size limitations for each of the emails and the some of the documents do tend to get a little large. And lastly, um, RSTP was instrumental in understanding and supporting our application. And with a special uh, thanks to Anush Newman out of the Calgary's RSTP office, who was invaluable in uh, supporting us for our a process as we learned what needed to be done and also the application process and then subsequent um, feedback. So, so RSTP can be a valuable resource uh, if you're unsure uh, what's required and how to proceed. I have a little uh, reference list for future reference if anybody's interested in that, but uh, uh, that's it for, for AAC's presentation. So back to Shauna. Thank you, Brent, and thank you, Jana Lee. And uh, um, so, uh, um, Brent, I'm I'm wondering if if you could uh, post the uh, list of links to the meetup, um, as you can just post it as a comment to the meetup, and then um, and also if you could uh, post it to the chat, and then if people want to uh, to follow up on any of those. Um, okay, and. Um, now, I will turn the meeting over to Dawit for some more detailed information. Thank you, Shauna. Liz is going to start and I'll take over somewhat halfway. So Liz, on to you. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to our part of the presentation. So to begin, I just would like to acknowledge um, and recognize that I am located in Mi'kmaq the traditional and unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people. As groups that work with refugees, we are grateful for the treaties of peace and friendship, and we recognize our responsibility to work towards reconciliation. The main office of RSTP um, is, and its satellite offices are located on traditional territories of many different indigenous peoples and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. So we acknowledge the welcome extended by Indigenous peoples to newcomers. We also acknowledge Indigenous peoples continuing care for the land and waters of this continent. RSTP further respects and affirms the inherent and treaty rights of Indigenous peoples across the land and commits to carry out its activities in the spirit of our presentation today is adapted from a two-hour presentation that we usually give, and it is uh, on group of five, an overview. My name is Liz Macbeth. 
as I said, I'm located in Mi'kma'ki or Nova Scotia. So Nova Scotia and Newfoundland are my areas of training. Later in this presentation, I'll be handing it over to Dawit, who is the Ontario Greater Toronto Area Trainer. The agenda you can expect from us today We'll begin with an overview of the private sponsorship of refugees pro program. We'll move into what is a group of five and both who can be sponsored and who can sponsor. Sponsorship obligations, the application process, and an answer period at the end of this with our fellow presenters. So you might be wondering. What is the Refugee Sponsorship Training Program? Many people call us RSTP, and we are a national program. We're designed to support the private sponsorship community. We're a free program. We are funded by Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, otherwise known as IRCC. So we have a team of trainers like Dawit and myself located all across the different provinces and territories of Canada. We were founded in 1998, and RSTP offers a variety of workshops, information sessions, webinars. We offer an e-training for a more in-depth look. We offer resources on our website, fact sheets, an e-bulletin, and we answer questions about sponsorship. So the Canadian Refugee Sponsorship Programs at a glance. On this slide, I will talk a little bit more about the different options that are available. I'll briefly go into the four Canadian refugee sponsorship resettlement programs um, so that we can look at the different elements for each of those. As you can see here, those are private sponsorship of refugees, as we are discussing today. Also, blended visa office referred, or BVOR. Joint Assistant Sponsorship, sometimes known as JAS, and Government Assisted Refugees, sometimes referred to as GAR. So there are different supports offered throughout these different programs, financial, settlement, how they are referred to IRCC, and are the refugees known to the sponsor? And it looks different throughout each of these different programs. So, as you can see, there are different levels of settlement done by the government or by the sponsor themselves across these different categories. In private sponsorship, the settlement is done entirely by the sponsor themselves. In government assistance, the government does the entirety of that. There is a shared system within joint assistance. And in BVOR, again, the sponsor provides that. Financial support across the different ones also looks very different. In private sponsorship of refugees, the sponsor provides that support. It is jointly shared in BVOR. In both JAZZ and VAR, that is provided by the government. So as you can see here, only one of these categories has the refugee referred to IRCC by the sponsor. And that is private sponsorship of refugees program. And in only one of these as well, it, are the refugees known to the sponsor? So that brings us to group of five, as we're talking about today, which is positioned within private sponsorship of refugees. As I discussed earlier, we offer webinars online, and they will help step you through the different categories of private sponsorship as an overview. From decision through application and sponsorship to completion. We will be discussing many aspects of this in this overview today. And we should just keep in mind that completion involves independence of the new. So, who can sponsor? There are different types of organizations that can sponsor. And they are sponsorship agreement holders, groups of five, or 
community sponsors. So sponsorship agreement holders are often referred to as SAWs, not S-A-W, but surprisingly S-A-H. And those are incorporated organizations. They have signed a formal sponsorship agreement with Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. Whereas the community sponsors and the group of fives are different. Community sponsors are any organization, association, or corporation located in the community where the refugees are expected to settle. And group of fives are what we will be going more in depth with today. This same part on the last part of the slide is uh, on the next slide. So let's move on. Okay. So group of five. In order to form a group of five, there must be five or more Canadian citizens or permanent residents. Everyone must be above 18 years. You must have the financial and settlement capacity, and you must live in the expected community of settlement, collectively arranging for the sponsorship. So speaking of sponsor settlement responsibilities, what you might expect within that category would be welcoming them at the airport, applying for health card and other documents, finding housing, enrolling in English classes, connecting with a settlement agency, finding a doctor, a dentist, or other health services. As far as um, financial capacity, when submitting a PSR application, sponsors must be able to provide enough convincing documentation to show the origin of the funds provided. So the goal is to prove that funds will not only be available upon arrival, but also to prove that they're not coming from the refugee themselves. Speaking a little bit more about sponsor eligibility, what makes a sponsor ineligible? And in this case, you can't be liable for any sponsorships that are in default. You cannot be convicted of a criminal offense less than five years after the sentence completion. You cannot be detained in a jail, a penitentiary, a prison, or reformatory, and not in default of any court-ordered support payments be that spousal or child. So on the flip side, who can be sponsored? We were speaking about eligibility before for sponsors. There are two different types of things that can determine who can be sponsored. Eligibility, but also admissibility. So in order to be eligible to be sponsored, you need to be outside your country of origin or habitual residence. You also cannot be in Canada. There needs to be no durable solution, meaning they cannot stay in their current country. They are unable or unwilling to return to a home country, or they cannot resettle in another safe country. You need to be a convention refugee abroad or country of asylum class and be recognized by the UNHCR or a host state and have a sponsoring group in Canada. So the admissibility, security, criminal, and medical is actually done overseas in a different state. Perfect, thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm gonna take over from here. Um, I'll just clarify a few things from this slide and then I'll uh, Move to the next slide. Um, so the uh, uh, the convention refugee abroad and the country of asylum class um, those terms might be uh, new to folks. So I'm just going to uh, clarify a little bit what that is, and then I'll also stress about um, uh, the uh, last bullet on the eligibility part, which is the refugee must be recognized by UNHCR or the host state. Um, uh, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yes, yes, everything's good. Thanks, Shana. Okay. So uh, the Convention Refugee Abroad and the Country of Asylum class. Uh, so there is the, the broad definition of a refugee, um, <clears throat> excuse me, based on the 1951 Refugee Convention, which is um, 
if a refugee, if a person um, has a well-founded fear of persecution uh, based on their gender, um, their, um, I'm probably not going to remember all the, the, uh, the categories, but because of their nationality, if they are a member of a specific social group, uh, because of their religion uh, and things like that. So that's the definition of a refugee. That's more individual, individualistic, uh, how that individual is personally being affected based on these categories. Um, and the country, is, the, country is, the country of asylum class uh, is meant to fill the gap uh, that is not covered by the definition of the convention refugee. Uh, based on the 1951 Refugee Convention. And the refugee, the country of asylum class definition is more broad, and it's not necessarily individualistic. Um, as long as an individual is being affected uh, by civil war, uh, by uh, human rights um, uh, violations in their country or in their host, uh, in their habitual residence, it's more general. So it's not necessarily targeting the individual, but if they are affected by it, whether it targets them or not, they would, uh, they would qualify for the definition of, they would fit the definition of a refugee. And so, uh, but that's not enough for them to qualify for groups of five and community sponsorship. For sponsorship agreement holder, as long as they fit the definition of a refugee based on those two categories, they could be sponsored by a sponsorship agreement holder. However, for group of five and community sponsorship, it's not enough that they fit the definition of a refugee, but they have to be recognized and they have to have a proof of a refugee status given by UNHCR or by the host state. Um, and to get this recognition, um, you have to be registered, you have to go through an interview and decision has to be made. Uh, and if that decision is positive, uh, either UNHCR or the host state provide a document and that document must be included with the application when you submit a group of five or community sponsorship application. Um, and as Liz said, obviously, um, only the principal applicant needs to um, fulfill the eligibility requirements. However, uh, both the dependents and the principal applicant need to go through uh, the admissibility requirements. Um, so it's recommended that a person who have a UNHCR document uh, should be the, uh, the principal applicant um, if for them to qualify for Group of Five and Committee sponsorship. And I'll talk at the end of this, uh, somewhere in the middle, about um, accompanied and not accompanied family members as well. Um, so... Let me just open this. So a little bit about the eligibility and admissibility requirements. Um, uh, as I said, I, I mentioned that only the principal applicant is the person who uh, would uh, need to fulfill the eligibility and uh, admissibility requirements. Uh, and now the question that comes is who should be included in the principal applicant's application? Um, and as you see on the slide, uh, the spouse uh, or common law partner of the principal applicant can be included in the same application. And dependents under the age of 22 can also be included in the same application. Um, and those dependents can be um, children of both parents or children of either parents, uh, the principal applicant or the spouse from a different marriage, uh, they can be included. And if the principal applicant um, has a, um, a dependent uh, that is not related to uh, the principal applicant or their spouse or common law partner by blood, but they are financially and emotionally dependent on them, um, they, they, they cannot be included with the same application, but a different a separate application can be prepared and linked to the principal applicant's um, application. And this is only if the, if the dependent child, uh, dependent only emotionally and financially, but not dependent uh, as a child or spouse, um, 
if they are under the age of 18, they can be, uh, the separate application can be prepared and linked and the principal applicant can sign the application for the, uh, uh, the dependent, we call a de facto dependent. So if they're under 18, if they're over 18, um, separate application can be prepared and they can sign the application for themselves and that application can be included. Uh, however, if they're under 18, the principal applicant can sign the application for them and they have to fulfill all the eligibility and admissibility requirements because a separate application is being um, uh, a separate application is being provided. And as I said, the de facto dependent must have the refugee uh, proof of refugee status as well. Um, and so, uh, as uh, when you show a proof of refugee status, uh, an asylum seeker certificate, refugee claimant document or the UNRWA document that's given to Palestinian refugees uh, is not um, valid proof of uh, refugee status for group of five and community sponsorship. So as uh, uh, Liz uh, briefly talked about, uh, some of the sponsor obligations include uh, providing financial support for food, for shelter, house utilities, and uh, the everyday living expenses. Uh, and of course, for clothing, furniture, household goods. Um, and uh, if none of the sponsors speak the same language, uh, uh, you can locate interpreters from um, somebody in your area who speaks the same language, um, connecting them to um, uh, family doctors and dentists, um, uh, help them apply for provincial health care, um, they come with uh, 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 an insurance called the IFH, uh, Interim Federal Health Program. Uh, this is an insurance program that's uh, um, provided only for newcomers, for um, uh, privately sponsored newcomers. Um, they receive this uh, unique uh, healthcare services. Uh, it, it covers some, some drug um, um, and I believe some uh, eye vision and, and dental uh, services as well. And it's uh, valid for one year during the sponsorship period. And of course, during this time, simultaneously, they can also apply for the provincial healthcare. And of course, enroll um, either in adult training or uh, in school and to introduce them to um, their new uh, community, um, to help them um, identify their, their interests and their hobbies and to um, connect them with settlement agencies as well who provide uh, settlement services. And of course, provide orientation about their new community, about banking, transportation, um, and so on. And of course, help them to find a job. Uh, so we use this uh, little chart to um, uh, visualize the uh, sponsorship period uh, from the day you welcome them at the airport uh, to uh, finding housing and uh, furniture and setting up the apartments um, and uh, register them to um, uh, their, their uh, uh, government, to get their government documents to enroll them to school, uh, open a bank account and so on until the end of the sponsorship period uh, in which hopefully, maybe not fully, uh, but they achieve um, uh, self-sufficiency and independence. Again, uh, self-sufficiency is not something that can be achieved in one year, uh, but sponsors are encouraged to think about self-sufficiency uh, from the beginning uh, so that uh, at the end of the sponsorship period, um, as, uh, newcomers are familiar with their area. Um, they can uh, move around independently and explore their new community and hopefully uh, find a job and, and uh, settle in. And uh, here's the, uh, the sponsorship cost table. Uh, this shows um, the uh, minimum financial support that sponsors are required to provide. Uh, as we know, uh, you all know, uh, sponsors 
uh, go above and beyond to provide way more than the minimum uh, RAP rates, the resettlement assistance uh, rates. Um, and however, the, the uh, minimum requirement that sponsors are obligated to provide is what you see on the screen. Uh, and the financial support uh, is divided into two, um, as uh, Brent uh, mentioned earlier. It's divided um, as a startup cost and a monthly income support. So the startup cost is meant to be provided at the beginning when they arrive, um, or the sponsors uh, buy uh, the, um, the items they need, uh, the furniture to pay the rent, to provide household equipment, to buy food, at the beginning, um, and the startup cost is meant to be the remaining, excuse me, divided by 12 um, and uh, provided to them on a monthly basis. Uh, and again, we encourage sponsors to keep track of their support and to have the record of this uh, in case IRCC um, uh, selects your case to uh, check whether the required financial and non-financial support has been provided to the newcomers. Uh, so it's highly recommended to uh, keep track of the support and to have record of that. And so uh, again, as Brett mentioned earlier, there are uh, three ways of demonstrating uh, the financial support um, that uh, the groups uh, collectively are um, responsible for, uh, but it could come um, uh, not necessarily from all five sponsors or more, but it could also come from, uh, it could come from individuals, it could come from um, uh, three or four people, and, and I'll talk about each of those. Um, so each person is assessed individually when they provide uh, financial support or not. Um, and when funds are um, pledged from income and not necessarily have the, uh, the trust fund, a minimum of three sponsors must provide uh, the financial support. And of course, um, uh, they have to provide proof of income. So I'll go through uh, each of uh, the first and second option. And the third option is uh, obvious. It's a combination of option number one and option number two. So I have this. Um, a scenario that I uh, thought it would be helpful for us to uh, uh, demonstrate for option number two, which is when you pledge from your income, when you promise to provide financial support uh, from your income. So as you see, uh, for example, if uh, as we uh, saw in the uh, first slide, in the previous slide, when you pledge from your income, a minimum of three sponsors must pledge. So one person cannot do that, two people cannot do that. It has to be a minimum of three sponsors pledging from their income. So for example, uh, if XYZ's group uh, are sponsoring a family of four, uh, while the minimum requirement is 28,800, as we saw in the sponsorship cost table, uh, they know living expenses in their area is higher, so they're providing extra $5,000. So the funds they're providing is 32,500. And as you see, um, Sponsor X is providing 25,000, sponsor Y is providing 5,000, sponsor Z is providing 2,000. Um, as long as a minimum of three sponsors are pledging, um, it's not a requirement that all three provide the same amount, right? It could, based on their income, um, um, some could provide higher and others can provide um, less. So, um, and, and now let's demonstrate if, uh, a sponsor X has the financial capacity to provide $25,000. And the, the calculation that IRCC use to determine whether sponsor, sponsors have um, uh, the financial capacity to provide uh, what they're pledging, uh, this is the calculation they use. So let's say Mr. X uh, is a public transit driver and their annual income is $52,000. So when you pledge from your income, you're required to, prove, to provide your proof of income. And that is, uh, uh, it could be a T4, or a notice of assessment. Um, and let's say Mr. X is providing their notice of assessment and their annual income is 52,000. Once um, IRCC officer re uh, receive this application, 
um, what they do is they check the notice of assessment and they check the financial profile form. These are one of the forms that the sponsor, uh, sponsors are contributing financially needs to fill out and they check the family size of the sponsor. Uh, so let's say Mr. X is a single person um, and they, their annual income is 52,000. And because they're single, uh, the annual cost of living for themselves uh, uh, using the sponsorship cost table is 16,500. And ILCC always, always check their system if that individual uh, is, is uh, uh, responsible of other sponsorship applications. And for example, Mr. X in this case uh, is responsible uh, for 5,500 for a different sponsorship application and they are providing 25,000 for this application. So when you make this calculation, you see the remaining 5,000. Uh, so as long as the reminder uh, uh, amount is greater than zero, uh, um, uh, Mr. X would be eligible to contribute $25,000. But if let's say the remain, uh, the re if the income was less than 50,000 and if the remaining income was less than zero, then Mr. X would not be eligible to uh, contribute $25,000 and the application would be returned. Uh, or uh, sometimes IRCC send a procedural fairness letter and they would ask the sponsors to find another person. Uh, but again, given in this uh, scenario that the highest amount is coming from Mr. X, I think the application would be automatically returned or refused and the sponsors need to provide uh, they need to prepare a new application. They need to do everything from scratch um, and uh, submit a new application. So again, in this case, uh, Mr. X is eligible to pledge $25,000. So that was uh, option number one. And option number two uh, is to show proof of funds holding trust. This option was provided because uh, option number two uh, the, the option that I just explained before um, would disadvantage some people who might have savings in their, in their account or um, uh, they can fundraise for the application. Uh, so IRCC uh, provided this option. Um, and so for this option, uh, a minimum of two sponsors can open a bank account and they can invite the sponsors or non-sponsors to contribute to this fund. Um, and so uh, once uh, this new bank account is uh, opened, people from the sponsorship group or outside can contribute and the sponsors are required to provide an original letter from the bank that shows uh, how much money they have, the name of the sponsors, the account number and the account balance. And all bank statements must be also provided so that IOCC can see uh, the deposits of that bank account from, uh, again, sponsors or non-sponsors. And of course, the sponsors are required to provide an explanation about the source of the funds, and they need to also show documentation. And the reason for that is A, um, IRCC want to make sure that the fund did not come from the sponsors themselves, excuse me, from the refugee themselves, and the fund is coming from... Um, uh, other leg uh, legitimate source, and it's not coming from, um, uh, you know, groups that are illegal groups. It could be uh, terrorist groups or uh, illegal groups. So uh, the reason that IRCC wants to see a detailed explanation of uh, the source of the funds and also documentation uh, provided is to make sure that the source are not coming from the refugees and it's coming from other legitimate sources. Um, so as I said earlier, um, as long as uh, the family members, all the family members that can be included in the same application are declared in the principal applicant's application, the original application, family members who are um, not accompanying the principal applicant will have the opportunity to um, uh, reunite with their family members in Canada. So for example, if the principal applicant uh, is leaving a child behind, 
for many reasons, the child could not accompany the principal applicant. Maybe it could be because they are still in the country of origin and they, are, they could not travel from the country of origin or for other reasons. Um, they can uh, stay behind. However, the sponsors are required to provide financial support uh, for the uh, dependent who's not accompanying uh, the, the principal applicant and their family members. Uh, they are still required to provide financial support and the financial support would still remain um, in, in the fund. For example, if they are using the options and if they pledged uh, from their income, they are required to give that money once the, uh, the non-accompanying family member comes to Canada. So the principal applicant have one year during the uh, sponsorship period to apply for a one year window application. So this is a unique opportunity that's given for um, uh, newcomers who left family members behind who has been declared in their original application. If for whatever reason, the principal applicants and their sponsors fail to submit a one year window application during the sponsorship period, uh, the, the sponsors are, not, are no longer responsible to provide financial and settlement support for the uh, dependent who left behind, but the principal applicant can sponsor that child uh, through the family class, which is not part of the private sponsorship. Uh, and now we'll uh, briefly talk about um, the uh, processing time. Um, uh, the processing time was one of the challenges that Brent uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and I'll uh, talk a little bit uh, about how that works and what are the challenges that um, IRCC and sponsors are facing, um, especially today. So uh, sponsors, when they uh, uh, identify uh, the individual they want to sponsor, once they check the eligibility requirements and uh, prepare a, a group of five application, they submit it, uh, one of the sponsors submitted to IRCC. Um, uh, fortunately, we are not covering that part on how to uh, submit an application, uh, but if there is an interest, I would be happy to do that. Or we can send resources that are uh, been already uh, prepared by, uh, by RSTP. Once the application is prepared and submitted to, IR, to um, the Resettlement Operations Center. It's a, an IRCC branch who receives applications and assess the eligibility of the sponsors. Uh, and uh, applications can be sponsored by email or by mail, uh, but it's highly recommended that applications are being submitted by email because uh, IRCC officers are now working from home and it's easier and it's faster to submit application by email. And so once this application is uh, uh, submitted to RELCO, the Resettlement Operations Center in Ottawa, they evaluate the, uh, sponsor, uh, uh, the sponsor's application, the sponsor side of the application, and of course the refugee status determination document as well. Um, once they check this application, once they are convinced uh, and satisfied that the sponsors have a good plan and they have the financial uh, support, then they transfer the application to the visa office abroad. Uh, and the visa office abroad uh, is where they make the uh, uh, eligibility requirements in depth and the admissibility requirements. And that's where the time that takes a lot longer um, at the visa office abroad. And so what the visa office abroad does is they, again, assess the application um, they invite the principal applicant and their dependents for an interview. They screen uh, the application and the interview. Uh, once they're satisfied with the interview, they uh, do the admissibility requirements, the medical checkup, criminal background checkup, and security checkup. And if they are satisfied with all this, then they arrange uh, the travel. And in arranging the travel, uh, the International Organization for Migration and the UNHCR are involved in uh, assisting IRCC to arrange the travels to, and IRCC provide loans, uh, they provide visa, they provide travel documents, and uh, they assist um, 
newcomers to come to Canada. And upon arrival, uh, newcomers are permanent residents. Uh, I'll talk uh, in the coming few slides um, what should not happen and what rights uh, they have in Canada. But basically, they are permanent residents. They will have almost uh, all rights that citizens have upon arrival. Okay, so we, we, uh, we've seen this slide. Uh, um, as I said, uh, we are only covering the, uh, the first part um, on the slide, which is the eligibility um, and admissibility requirements, the financial support um, and uh, the application process. Um, however, I'm gonna briefly talk about um, the, the application process, as I've already covered, uh, the sponsor, um, the sponsorship period, which is one year, and also what should we expect uh, beyond the sponsorship period and how should we prepare for the end of the sponsorship period. Um, just give me one second. I hope you can still see my slide. We can still see it. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to uh, briefly talk about. Um, so, let's say you uh, you uh, identify the refugee, you check the eligibility requirements, uh, you prepare the application, you submit the application to IRCC. The application has been um, approved at the initial level by the Resettlement Operations Center. The application is transferred to the visa office abroad, and now you're expecting for arrival. And what are the things sponsors need to do while waiting for the arrival um, uh, of the newcomers? And some of the things you need to do, obviously, is to make sure that you have the settlement plan, right? You submitted the application. When you submit the application, uh, there is a part in one of the forms where you have to um, uh, show your settlement plan, right? Uh, what kind of services you'll be providing, how are you going to uh, uh, provide shelter, um, who is going to help what, all that kind of things. So while you're waiting, you need to revisit this settlement plan and make sure you have a good plan and make sure you uh, identify the needs and the interests of the newcomers so that it's easier uh, for you to provide the settlement support. Uh, and of course, you have to uh, uh, know what the wrap rates are, what the minimum uh, re uh, resettlement assistance requirements are, because sometimes in some provinces, those assistance change over time. And as we know, the processing time could take longer, especially now because of COVID-19. And so in two years or in three years, um, uh, you should revisit uh, the financial requirements and make sure that you have the required amount. And there might be changes in, in the family composition. Let's say a child that was uh, 15 or 17 years old when you submit the application might be 18 or 19 um, when they are about to arrive. And so that would change the financial requirements. So when they are over 18, you need to provide a full 16,500 for that individual and not as when you submit the application and when they were under 18. So when they were under 18, uh, they would be part of the family. You would, you would only contribute, you would only provide the financial support um, as part of the family. For example, if they are a family of four, it's 28,500. But if that child is now 19, when they arrive, the financial support will be higher because you would need to provide 16,500 for that individual who's over 18. So you need to uh, revisit the wrap rates and you can use the RSTP financial calculator. Um, uh, Liz, if I can ask you to uh, share uh, the link the, for, the, uh, for the financial calculator. That is very, very helpful. All you need to do is put some information about uh, the newcomers and it will exactly tell you how much money you need to provide uh, at the time of the arrival. And of course, if you can manage expectations, that's very, very, very important. Um, if you can do that pre-arrival, that's perfect. 
if for whatever reason uh, it's not possible for the sponsors to contact the newcomers and manage the expectation, you can do that upon arrival. Uh, so why is it uh, important to uh, manage the expectations and to uh, uh, provide to sponsors what the realistic expectation is and what their life would look like upon arrival, right? Uh, as we know from outside, um, the what newcomers know is Canada, as I think Brent mentioned earlier, is one of the best countries for newcomers and refugees. So um, we don't uh, necessarily know what the newcomers expect when they come here. Uh, and so to try to uh, tell them the real expectations, the realistic expectations, it's very important. So on one hand, uh, when expectations are realistic, uh, it's easy to experience success because you're ready for what um, your life will look like when you come here. And if there is a uh, unrealistic expectation that might lead to disappointment for newcomers and then might create uh, some sort of tension um, uh, between uh, the, the sponsors and the newcomers. And this, the expectation is not uh, only for the newcomers, it's also the expectation of the sponsors. Um, so misinformation is, uh, uh, misinformation leads to a newcomer's unrealistic expectation about their settlement, about their rights, about the sponsors, and about life in Canada. So I think trying to manage those expectations is very, very important. And of course, sponsors can work with settlement agencies. Uh, settlement agencies, um, are there to provide, to assist the sponsors. So it's not um, a complementary, it's a supplementary to what the sponsors need to do. So the sponsors are the uh, legally obligated uh, body to provide uh, settlement services. However, settlement agencies can provide uh, services that maybe, for example, the sponsors do not have the uh, the skills and the professional capacity to provide. For example, it could be counseling. Um, if the sponsors are not uh, counselors by profession, um, they can uh, contact settlement agencies to provide settlement services. Uh, and there is a link again, please, if I can ask you, and I'll be, uh, we'll be sharing a follow-up email as well, and we'll be happy to send uh, more resources, but there is a link, an ILCC link. Um, I think it's called uh, settlement agencies near me or something that helps you to identify settlement agencies in your area uh, by just putting your postal code or your city um, and that provides a list of settlement agencies in your area uh, and the other thing that sponsors need to uh, uh, keep in mind uh, are some ethical considerations right so part of your app your uh, ethics considerations should include uh, the recognition of the uh, newcomer's self-determination, right? So at the end of the day, at the end of the sponsorship uh, period, uh, they, they will uh, be on their own. Uh, so you should include them in the settlement planning from the beginning. Um, you should uh, let them do uh, decisions that um, um, are about their settlement life and, and uh, about their experiences. Um, your role is more as um, a, a, a guiding uh, body, uh, provide the services, uh, let them know, uh, provide orientation, uh, but keep in mind that uh, at the end of the day, um, um, they are uh, independent, they can make decisions about their life. Uh, be also mindful about privacy, um, as well as equity issues. Uh, when you provide orientation about Canada, provide orientation as well, not only about the good things, but also about the challenges, right? Um, they should know that there are challenges about uh, gender-related uh, 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 difficulties, uh, about sexual orientation, uh, connect them about uh, with their uh, uh, community, uh, ethnic community, um, and so 
the few things that should not happen and sponsors should be aware of um, are uh, newcomers should not receive social assistance from the government during the sponsorship period uh, because uh, the sponsors are provide as expected to provide the, min the minimum financial support. They should not apply for subsidized housing during the sponsorship period. Again, sponsors are required to provide housing for them. And sponsors should not, uh, should not cease providing financial support. Uh, without getting into details, I can uh, say that uh, sponsors can deduct financial support if newcomers start working and, and, uh, 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 and having household income. Um, if there is a sponsorship breakdown, obviously sponsors are not required to provide financial support and sponsors are not required to provide financial support uh, after the end of the sponsorship period. Um, however, during the sponsorship period, uh, sponsors should not uh, cease providing financial support. Um, yeah, so that's uh, more or less uh, what we could provide. Uh, well, at the end of the sponsorship period, sponsors should uh, start planning for the end of the sponsorship period. For example, um, at month nine, maybe they should start planning um, where the individual the, or the refugee family will be living, for example, if they cannot afford to live in the same uh, apartment, um, if they are going to move out of the city, um, really uh, sponsors should help the newcomers to plan for the end of the sponsorship period because um, after the end of the sponsorship period, sponsors are on their own.